Okay, 11 o'clock, here we go. So uh, I hope that you were able to wrap your heads around new substitution, at least to a point that you feel somewhat better about it than you did when we ended class last time. Um, we're gonna do 6-1 today. Um, today's a big day, all right? Today's a big day. Um, this is where things start to pile on very quickly, all right? So it's, we're gonna be doing problems today and you're gonna be like, wow, that was a long problem. <laughs> you know, like, that took me a page to do. So things are gonna start to get pretty uh, drawn out and uh, it's just like a big shift of gears right now in this class. And then from here on out, that sort of pace continues. So um, in terms of our timeline, today we're gonna do 6-1. Um, uh, next class, we're gonna have our first exam, right? So we're gonna come in here and we're gonna take the exam. Um, you'll have to have your cameras on, your cameras on, you'll have to set up your camera off to the side so I can see you in your workspace. Um, <clears throat> I'll be sending you the exam at the beginning of class through Canvas, you can print it or you can hand write it, copy it. And then once you copy it, you put everything else away, just your camera. A blank piece of paper and you take the test you know by hand and then you'll take pictures send it to me just like you have been with your homework okay um <clears throat> so the uh review for the exam what i what i put together because it's very few topics the review is not a set of problems it's just telling you about how many questions there are and what to expect on each problem. So <clears throat> the first problem is gonna be just making sure you know how to differentiate uh, the inverse trig stuff. So this is 3.5, 3.6. So inverse trig hyperbolic, inverse hyperbolic, make sure you know how to do chain rule, product rule, quotient rule within with those functions. Uh, number two is gonna be a problem like we did in the last homework. Well, was it 4.7, I think? where I give you a second derivative and ask you to go backwards to the original function, where I give you some conditions. And then after that, it's antiderivatives. So you got power rule, make sure you know how to do the power rule. Next couple of problems, use substitution, that's last class. And then the last four problems of the test all are all about what we do today. So you're not gonna have a whole lot of time to digest what we do today. So I think it's gonna be a busy week, a busy weekend for you. A busy next few days. Um, but yeah, so let's get into it and then maybe we come back and revisit this um, at the end. <clears throat> so integration by parts. When I was learning this, my professor, he really tried to emphasize this idea of what he called the transferring of the derivative, that that's really what integration by parts is about this thing called transferring the derivative. So I'll explain that in a minute. Let me first motivate where the, where the whole idea of integration by parts comes from. So we, we know from Cal 1 that we have this, the product rule, right? That if you're given two functions, right? F and G, right? Now here I'm gonna call F U and I'm gonna call uh, the G function V. But if we take two functions, f and g, and we, we multiply them, and we want to know what the derivative is, we have to use the product rule. And this was the product rule. And you may have seen this in different, you know, it may have been rearranged in different order, but, but basically the product rule says that you have to take the derivative of one of the functions, multiply it by the other function, and then add to that the reverse, the derivative of the other function and the other ones, you know, without the derivative. The order in which you do that doesn't matter because addition is commutative, multiplication is commutative. So you may have seen this arranged in many different ways. Hopefully you understand the main idea though, right? Derivative one, leave the other one alone, add to that, derivative of the other one, leave the other one alone. So that is that is the product rule. Now, if we write it in terms of u and v instead, it looks like this. Take u times v, take the derivative. You'll take derivative of u times v plus derivative of v times u, all right? So, Hopefully in your uh, calculus class, well, I don't know. I don't remember my Cal 1. Did I prove the product rule? I wanna say I did prove the product rule, but I don't remember actually. 
Either way, that's the rule. You have to believe that it's true. That's how we take derivatives of products, all right? So with that in mind, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take this and somehow we're gonna use this formula to help us find antiderivatives. And the technique is called integration by parts. So here's, here's how we get it. We start, we start with this and we say to ourselves, okay, well, we're taking the derivative, right? On the left side, we're taking the derivative of something and it turns out to be this. I'm gonna now come in here and take the antiderivative on both sides of this equation, all right? Take the antiderivative. So if I have u times v, I take its derivative and then I take its antiderivative, that should, those two operations should undo each other, right? So I should just get <clears throat> u times v here. It's almost like you're taking a square root and then squaring it, kind of, kind of the same idea. Those two things undo each other. So you just get back what was here. On the right-hand side, it's not so simple because I have the antiderivative of two things that are being added together. So the most that I could do is split this into two separate antiderivatives. I can do that because you're allowed to do that, right? You're allowed to do that when you have addition or subtraction, you can split it into two, two integrals or two antiderivatives, just like we know we could do that for differentiation, right? So do you all agree with me that this so far, this is, this is true, like what I've written down, this is true? Yeah. The next thing I'm gonna do is <clears throat> I'm going to take this integral right here, and I'm gonna subtract it on both sides of the equation. So I'm gonna subtract integral u prime v, u prime v on both sides, subtract integral u prime v. And then what I get on the left side is u times v minus the antiderivative of u prime v equals the antiderivative of v prime times u. Still agree this is, this is true, right? This is, this is, all I'm doing is rearranging stuff. The last thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna rewrite it with, with uh, I'm gonna write this side on the left and this side on the right. So I'm just gonna switch the order. So it's gonna look like this, integral. So I'm writing this one right here and watch, I'm gonna do one more thing here. I'm gonna switch u times v prime. So since these are two are multiplied, I can switch the order. And then that equals the left side of the equation, which was uv, and then minus the antiderivative. And then instead of doing u prime times v, I'm going to put v times u prime. This is the integration by parts IBP formula. It, it is a formula. Now, here's the thing about the integration by parts formula, all right? This is what you have to understand. Integration by parts formula does not give you a way to, to like find an antiderivative. Like U substitution was a technique where it said, oh, look for something in its derivative and then make the substitution and you follow this procedure to try and do it. That's what we did last class. This formula simply says, if you start with a certain integral, right? If you're trying to figure out what this is, there is a way that you can rewrite this in a new format where you get this new integral. And do you all see the difference? Well, you, you get this stuff out front, right? You've got this new stuff. This is kind of new, right? But do you all see the difference between these two integrals? Look what's inside of them. This one has u. Remember what u was, right? U was some function of x. And then multiply times that is the derivative of some function v, right? Some different function. Those are two different functions. U is some function. And then this is the derivative of some other function. If you ever see that, you can make this into a new integral and look at the new integral. What's in here? Well, what's happened? Instead of u, what do we have in the new integral? u prime. u prime. And instead of v prime, what do we have in the new integral? 
v, right? We have transferred the derivative. That derivative sign right there in green, in the new integral, it switched places. The prime went to the u instead of the v, right? And the u, which didn't have a prime, picked up the prime. Do you see that? We've transferred it. Now, believe it or not, that can be very useful to us. Very, very useful, as we're going to see. All right? Now, there is a way that you can kind of remember this formula. It's something that I was taught. It's this little saying. It's ultra, ultraviolet minus voodoo, V-O-O-D. D-O, I don't remember how to spell voodoo. What is it? I have it. D-O-O, D-O-O. D-O-O, it's D-O-O, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Not D-D. -D. Yeah, yeah, D-O-O, -O. that's right, D-O-O. -O. So this is just a cute little saying to kind of help you remember what's going on here. And the way it works is this. Um, this U is, ultra stands for U, violet is V, and then minus is the minus sign. Now you have to remember there's an integral now. And then this V here is the VU. And then the, <clears throat> the U prime is DU, is kind of like DU, DU, derivative of U. So U times V minus the integral of V times the derivative of U. And if it helps, it helps, okay? You'll hear me say it, but... Uh, that's it. <clears throat> That's the formula. All right. Is so, that on our formula sheet? It's on your formula sheet. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it is the first formula on the antiderivative uh, sheet. Right there. Now they use a slightly different notation. They put instead, they put dv here instead of v prime. I put v prime. And then instead of uh, u prime, they put du. So that's u prime right there. That's the formula. So question, like as a rule, like here we kind of jump between using the prime and the d uh, to, to show it's a derivative. Once, yeah. once you move past like calculus, getting into like the physics and stuff, it, is there a trend or is it just kind of up to the teacher as to which one you're going to see more of? You know, a lot of the, I, I, I think in physics, you see a lot more of the D than you okay. see the prime. Um, but those notations, I mean, it really, I think, depends on the author of the book more than anything else. Okay. But I, I think a lot of the D, because a lot of times in physics, you need to know what you're differentiating with respect to. So the D allows you to keep track of that. It's just gotcha. a better, better notation. The prime is great for Cal 1. Cal 2, Cal 3, we start to have to really know what the variable is. All right, you ready? Today is just examples, all right? So here's our first example. Now, the bad news about these examples is that I kind of give you a hint over here for each one, but that's just so you can reference back and say, okay, you know, this was a basic example, all right? So here's a very basic example of an integration by parts. So we're looking at this antiderivative, right? We're trying to find the antiderivative of this. It's x sine of 10x dx. Now look, here's where things start to get messy, all right? Because you now have u substitution, don't you? That's what you did. we did last class. We have this u substitution. We have to first make sure we can't do it that way because if we can, let's do it that way. It's easier, it's, it's cleaner. So we look at this and we say, do we see something and it's derivative? That's I'm thinking about last class. So I look at it and I say, okay, well, I see 10X, right? And the derivative of that would be 10, which I would be, I really, I do have a one here. So I could look at that as, yeah, I do have the derivative 10X. So I'm just off by a constant, right? But I have this X out here. And that's, that's an issue. Like if that X wasn't there, I would just do like a basic U substitution, but there is an X there. So U substitution is not going to work here, all right? So that, 
you see what I'm saying? Like last class, you have to understand that method and be comfortable with it because now you have to decide that you can't use it, right? So the only way to know you can't use it is if you're comfortable with it and know that this wouldn't get you anywhere. So, all right, we can't do it. So now what I'm gonna do is try integration by parts. So when it comes to integration by parts, again, we have this formula, it's integral u times v prime equals u times v minus integral v times u prime. All right, that's what we got. So when we look at this integral, what we have to do is, is realize we're starting here on the left side. And so we, one of the, one, we have two factors, right? In this formula, there are two factors. There's the u and there's the v prime. So when we look at this, x times sine 10x dx, we have two things there, right? We have an x and we have a sine of 10x. One of those needs to be the u and the other one needs to be the, the derivative of v. And we have to figure out which one. Does that make sense? Like, I have to figure that out. Which one of these is u? Which one of these is v prime? The way you determine that, and this is the, this is the key to integration by parts, the way you determine which one is gonna be u is to think about the transferring of the derivative. So let me see if this makes sense. There's kind of two options I have here. Let me do it this way. Oh shit, come on. I have two choices here. It's kind of like, I could treat, on the first one, I could let the x be the u, and then I would have times, and then everything else would be my v prime. v prime will always include the dx because it's the derivative of something. So it's gotta have the dx in there. That's one way I could do it. The other way I could do it is to let the sine 10x be the u, and then let the x along with the dx together be my v prime. Make sense? Those are like my two options here. So the way to determine which one it, which one it should be is again, to think about the transferring of the derivative. In the new integral, right? In my new integral over here, I'm gonna have v u prime, right? v u prime. So let's think about what that would be for each of these. What would, what would u prime be over here? If I look at this one, if I let u be x, what would, v, what would u prime be? One. What would the derivative of x be? One. One, or one dx, right? That would be the derivative of, of uh, x. So I would get a one over there, wouldn't I? I would get a one. And then I would get v. Now, this is v prime, right? This is v prime. So V would be the antiderivative of this. With me? So I, I, I'm thinking like this. In my new integral, the derivative of that would be one dx, just one. And then the antiderivative of this, so I took the derivative of that, right, to get U prime. And then over here, to go from V prime uh, back to V, I would have to take the antiderivative of that. Does that feel like something you would wanna do? Take the derivative of X to get one, and then take the antiderivative of this, put those two together, and then integrate that answer. Would you rather do that? Would you rather do that? Or would you rather do this? Treat it the other way, which means take that one, take its derivative, and then take the X dx and take its antiderivative. Which one seems better? The first That's second option. option. The second? second one. Yeah. Second. So you're telling me that you want to take this integral, turn it into a new integral where it's going to have the antiderivative of V prime, which would be the antiderivative of X. What's the antiderivative of X? Uh, one half X squared. Okay, and then the derivative of sine of 10x, which would be something like cosine 10x with some other stuff in there. 
Yeah, that would that would be 10, 10 cosine ten x, wouldn't it? Yes. So that might be more of a mess actually once it's all taken apart. Yeah, why is it more of a mess? <clears throat> because the x became a one half x squared, right? It got more complicated, didn't it? The x went from an x to a one half x squared in the new integral. Where in, in this one, if we let u be x, in the new integral it turns into a one. And then it's no longer an issue, right? Okay, so I might be getting ahead of myself here. This is just this was just me trying to get you to think about it. Let's actually formally go through it the way that that you know is more systematic. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna I am gonna do these comparison both ways, but I'm gonna start with the first way. Okay, with the first way, I'm gonna let this be u and let all this be v prime. All right. And just, just for the sake of doing it, just remember, if I use dv instead of b prime, same thing, right? That's okay with you? If I use dv instead of b prime? Yes, yes? Yes, sir. Okay, so here's the way that I set up integration by parts. I always draw a table. I start with a table. And what I'm always gonna do in this table is in the top left corner, I'm gonna choose my u. In the bottom right-hand corner, I'm gonna choose my B prime, or I'm gonna just call it DB. That way, you, that way you can see it, so you don't accidentally miss that there's a prime there. Okay, that I get to choose, right? I get to choose which, which is which. So I am for this one, I'm gonna let, let the U be the X, and then the DB has to be the sine of 10X DX. All right, that was my choice. Now I'm going to finish, I'm going to complete the table. And what I mean by that is this table works this way. If you go down in the table, you're taking a derivative. If you go up in the table, you're doing an integral. So derivative goes this way. So I'm going to take derivative. So du, that's a derivative of u, will be equal to 1 dx. In other words, the derivative of u is just 1 dx because the variable here is x. So one dx, and then here I need the antiderivative of this. When I do that and move up on the table, I should get v, right? Because this was a derivative of v. So when I move up on the table, I should get v. This goes back to last class. We should know what the antiderivative of this is. It should be antiderivative. And negative one tenth cosine uh, 10x. Negative one tenth cosine 10x, exactly. We talked about that last time. Should I show it? I know we did it. Right here. This was it. It's talking about if you have a function with a linear one inside, you go backwards, right? We did it for sine. It's all right here. So <clears throat> this is where we are, right? Now, this integral now turns into a new thing. It's the uv minus integral v du, right? It's this thing. So first thing I'm going to do is I have to put u times v, right? What's u times v? Well, u times v is this top one, x times the V, which is the negative one tenth cosine of 10 X. Okay, that's U times V minus the integral. And now I do V and then times the derivative of U. V times the derivative of U, which is always going to be this diagonal. Those two multiplied together. These two multiply together. That's always that's always v u prime or v du, and that's what's this diagonal is what goes in the new integral. So my new integral is going to have the negative one tenth cosine of ten x, right? Times now this, which is just one dx.
This turns into negative one tenth x cosine of 10x plus one tenth integral cosine 10x dx. So all I did here was I pulled this negative one tenth out because I'm allowed to do that with integrals, bring the constant out. It changed this minus minus to a plus, And then I still had in here cosine 10x dx. Now that we've done all that, do you feel comfortable with the new integral you have? Yeah. Yeah, that you should. That should be something you're happy to see. Right. So we've started with an integral we couldn't find the antiderivative of. We used this integration by parts. And what it did is it created this new expression that has a new integral in it. And that new integral is actually easier than the original integral. Right. It's better. So I'm going to continue. I'm going to now take the antiderivative. So negative one ten x cosine 10 x plus one tenth, and now I'm taking the antiderivative. So I'm gonna take the antiderivative of this blue part, which we actually did that earlier. We already know that that's negative one tenth sine, wait, hold on, not negative, sorry, positive one tenth. We did not do that one earlier. Plus a constant. So if you take the antiderivative of cosine of 10 x, you get, one tenth sine ten x. Again, last class. And then I can put all this together and get a final answer here. There it is. Professor, I have a question. Yes. So it seems like since there's no way for us to go back up from that integral, why do we have to do so much like manipulation to equations in order for us to go back up? Like, why isn't there like a straightforward upstairs? Like, it's like like falling down the cliff and then not being able to come back up. We got to like figure out what path to take to like go up the mountain again. Does that make sense? I think it, it has to do with the fact that our rules for differentiation are complicated, right? When you take a derivative, product rule, quotient rule, chain rule, those are all very complicated. So if we're ever trying to undo any of that, go backwards, it's going to be complicated, right? I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess it's just how it is, right? It is how it is. Yeah. I mean, there's just, there's no easy way to do antiderivatives. It's not like a simple, simple way. Uh, I have a, I have a question on the, uh, the derivative on your table, the DV. So we took the antiderivative and we went, we went up, but there's no constant. Why is that? There's no, okay, good question. I was wondering if someone was going to notice that when we went up here, we, we should have had a plus C here, right? When we do an antiderivative. It's okay. A, that if, if we did that, Mohammed, when we did all this and did all this, that plus C would carry with us the whole way and it would wind up being out here at the end. So because it's a constant, it doesn't matter. It's gonna, it's, a, it's just gonna be there either way. Yeah, so just throw okay. it in at the very end. Okay, got it. Good question. Now look, I chose the U to be X and I chose the DV to be this, right? Let me show you the other way because, well, let's just look at it. If you go the other way and you say, let you be um, here, I write this down first. So this time I'm going to let the U be the sine of 10 X this time. And the DV is the X and the DX together. Remember the DX will always be down here. All right. So I could have done that. There's nothing wrong with me doing this yet. Okay. Let's continue. So now I fill out the table. So I take the derivative of this, the derivative of that, well, that's going to be, um, this is derivative, not antiderivative. So it's going to be 10 cosine 10x dx. That's the derivative of the sine of 10x. 
And then to get V, I need to take the antiderivative of X, which would give me one half X squared. And then Mohammed, this is where we have the plus C, but we're just gonna ignore it and just know that we're gonna have a plus C at the end. So following the formula now, this will be U times V. So these two multiplied together first. So one half X squared sine 10 X. So far, nothing's wrong. Minus integral. And now the, the V times the DU, the voodoo here. These two multiply together. And when I multiply those two together, I get one half X squared times 10 cosine of 10 X DX. Half of 10 is five, I can pull the five out. So minus five integral X squared cosine of 10 X DX. And then I still have the one half X squared sine 10 X up front. What's wrong with this? You still haven't so, gotten rid of the other variable. The X squared is not compatible with the 10 X. That's right. I mean, look, we started, the whole problem started with just an X in front, right? It was an X in front, which was a problem. And we've actually made it worse now, right? I mean, like we've used the formula and we've actually made it an X squared. So it's even more complicated than it was before. So what we want to get to is a point where we can foresee this. We don't want to just like try it just randomly. We need to be thinking about the transferring of the derivative. So in retrospect, going back to this now, I'm taking a look at the original problem here. I say, okay, I'm gonna use integration by parts. I'm gonna choose that to be my U because I know that in the new integral, it's gonna turn into a one, right? And then I'm gonna choose this to be my V prime or my DV because in the new integral, it's just the antiderivative of that, which I can do. And when I put that together with one, I'll be good, right? It'll be better. Does that make sense? I have a question. Yep. So what is a good rule of thumb for you to be like, Obviously, beginning, we're not going to know where it's going to go out and finish with practice. We'll be able to see it. But like, what's a good, good rule of thumb with your experience? Which one would most likely be switched? Does that make sense? I know what you're saying. Um, certain, certain professors like to give students like a, um, I don't know, kind of like a do this first, then that, then this, then that. Um, I personally am not a fan of that just because I don't want you to think about it in terms of like, do this first or go for this first. I want, I think it's better, more constructive for you as just a critical thinker to look at it and analyze each problem uniquely itself and just look at it because there is no co like cookie cutter, you just do this. If that were the case, that's what we would teach, right? Just, oh, if you see this, always let the, always let the power function. I could say, you know, always let this, you know, if you have X to a power, always let that be you, right? Doesn't, they don't always work like that, okay? I'll give you another example where that's not what you want to use for you. Even though you think you want to, it's not. So you have to, there's a lot more to it. So I think in time and practice, you'll start to hopefully be doing all this analyzing of what the new integral is going to look like mentally. And then in that, you'll make the decision. So maybe just stay tuned, Lewis. Just let this process kind of play out and see how it goes. You're just going to have to do it until you figure it out, I guess. Yeah, but you don't want to just like randomly... You don't want to just like randomly pick. You want to be thinking critically about what the new new one's going to look like. So, what's that? Sir, what it, I, I do have a question, sir. Would it be yeah, yeah. to keep like the sine, cosine, tangent, or whatever we're throwing at that as being the, yeah, that being the prime so we can go backwards because it's much easier to go backwards yeah. to it? So, uh, again, that I be say, our rule of thumb? Or does it just vary? I, I don't want to give you rules of thumbs, okay? Only because there, I can give you examples where it won't work, okay? So you get yourself in trouble. So you have to take everything into account. But I like the idea, Brandon, what you're saying. If you see sines and cosines, 
you, you want to think, oh, well, you know what? I don't mind in the new integral whether or not I have to do the antiderivative of that or not, because it'll be easy for me to do it, right? If it's sine or cosine. But that doesn't mean always make that your dB. Look at, look at this problem here. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have a different variable, t, right? t squared cosine of beta t. By the way, beta is going to be a constant, all right? It's just some number. We don't know what it is. So it's like, you know, the number 5 or 10, okay? So let's think, let's think about integration by parts. If I choose my u, if I choose my u to be this, that would make all of this the dv, right? Let's think about the new integral. The new integral is going to have the derivative of this. What would the derivative of this be? 2t. 2t. Two two so I'm going to write it down, even though I'm just kind of thinking out loud. The new integral is going to have 2t in there. And then it's going to have what? In relation to this, it would have the what? It would have the integral of that. The antiderivative of that. Negative one over b sine of bt, beta. It'd be positive, but yes, this would be. Oh, a, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. So in my new integral, I know that this right here is going to give me some sort of cosine. Oh, sorry, um, I'm doing the antiderivative sine beta t. And then I'm going to have a constant and stuff out from one over beta um, because that's how you take the antiderivative of this. So that's my new, that's my new integral. Do y'all do see that? I'm kind of like just thinking through what the new integral is going to look like. It's going to have a 2t, then something with a sign in it, right? That is not, still not doable, right? Because I have 2t in front of this, right? So maybe that wasn't the right way. Maybe I should have done it the other way. Maybe I should have done this. Maybe I should have done, let this be the u and this be the dv. What would my new integral look like then? Well, I have to take the derivative of this this time, right? Which would give me some like sine of beta t. I have a beta in there, it'd be negative beta. You know, I take the derivative of that, but then I need the, the antiderivative of this, don't I? Which would be a one third t cubed dt. This is even more complicated, right? Because now I've got a t cubed. Yes. So they both look like they don't work. Do you all understand? They both look like they're not getting us where we want to go. However, the first way was right. Because this is your first example of a repeated integration by parts, meaning we're going to have to do it more than once. So let's, let's go through this one. Let's say we start, let's let u be equal to t squared. Let's let the dv be equal to the cosine of beta t dt. Um, fi um, fill out the table. OK, do this on your own. Fill out the table and then rewrite, re rewrite the integral using the formula. I'll be right back.
I'm going to uh, fill this table out quickly and hopefully yours will match with mine. All right, so I just launched a poll. I just want to know how many of you got that. Okay. So does someone have a question on this? Where I got a certain part of it? Okay. No questions. All right. So in looking at this, let me clean up things. There's, I just want to clean up what's inside that new integral, which means I'm going to take constants out. So one over beta is a constant and the two is a constant. So I'm going to pull out a two over beta integral. And then what I have left in here is the sine of beta t and there's a t. So I'm going to put the t in front of the sine of beta t dt, all right? This is where we are. Unfortunately for us, this new integral has to be done with integration by parts. So we have to repeat the process on just that piece, which means we have to do another table Pick our U again, pick our DV again. And what would you choose for U? I'll use T. T. Why? Looks, Why T? Looks like a one. Yeah. And the new integral is going to become a one, right? right? So it's almost like we're chipping away at the power, aren't we? We're chipping away at that power. And the fact that the other parts of sine or cosine, it's gonna keep on oscillating back and forth as I differentiate or integrate it. So that's gonna keep on switching, but the T, I just keep on taking that power down each time I have to do an iteration of integration by parts. Okay, I'm gonna let U be T and then DV will be the sine. Uh, oh, sorry. sorry about the interruption, so sorry. No. Um, how do you know again, boom, we gotta do this again? like? Because I don't know how to do this integral. I, think, I have no, I think, I have no I think, method to do this. I think I get what he's asking. So uh, in the first problem, you had a you you had the same issue right here where uh, I think it was like we were trying to get the uh, the antiderivative of something. It w it would have been complicated. Mm -hmm. So we would have just it, because we're I guess we're inexperienced. We would have mm -hmm. just tried to integration by parts that. Uh, antiderivative and we'd just be caught in a loop. Does that make sense? I'm trying, no, I'm having trouble understanding that. Um, I so think like I know the answer. It's because if you go one way, it'll get worse. The X will progressively get bigger and bigger. The X, so the power will okay. become like two, three. But if you yeah. go the other way, you will just, you will have an ending step. Well, the other way you will never end. You'll keep uh, integrating. So really, you know what? My question is like how many, uh, repeated integration by parts are like usually is too much. Does that make okay, sense? So, so now that we've seen this one, right? Yeah. If I change this to T cubed, right? Yeah. You would, you would know now from the experience of this problem that you're going to need integration by parts three times. Three times, yeah. Because you're going to start with the T cubed. The first time through, it's going to chip it down to a T squared. Second time, it's going to go down to a, a T. And then third time, it's going to go down to a one. So we know we're on the right path if we're chipping down the uh, the exponents and making. But then you could also say like, like say that reverses, and then let's say that's like t, and now that cosine of t, like we can now use u sub again, but like that's 
You know what I mean? Like in the end where, because I'm pretty sure after we do a couple integrate, after we do a couple, um, couple of these, then we're going to have to do a use of in the end. Yeah, we may need we may need a use sub at some point in here. The, the question, the big question becomes with integration by parts is when you do it and you're looking at this voodoo that you've got to do the integral of, can you do it, right? Are you going to be able to handle this? Now, it might mean that you need another integration by parts or maybe it's a, maybe it's a U substitution. I don't know, but it's something you can handle. Now, I, Brandon wants to say something, but let me just finish this thought before I forget it. I said, if this was T cubed, it would tell us we need to do integration by parts three times. The only reason I would do think that way is because I have cosine here. And every time I do integration by parts, the cosine is gonna either switch to a sine or a cosine or a sine or a cosine. And that's never gonna change. It's either gonna be sine or cosine, right? And eventually the T cubed goes down to a one, right? If that were something other than cosine, I would not necessarily play the same game. It's the fact that it's a cosine that's allowing me to play the game. Brandon? It, it's interesting what you just said, made me think. But since we're doing it again, yeah. does that mean we're gonna have another constant? No, like, it'll all be one constant because- It's just gonna be all one constant? Because you would really have two constants and then you just put those constants together and you just have a constant. Like you still don't know what it is. Okay, right? so it's not like an antiderivative of an antiderivative where it's just Cx plus D. We don't, none of that applies here. Yeah, that's right. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, let's finish this one off because we need to finish this table. So we've got du, that becomes one dt. And then our V is our antiderivative of sine beta T, which is going to be negative uh, one over beta cosine of beta T. Which means what's in black here becomes, I've got to do these two multiply together. So negative one over beta T cosine of beta T right, minus the integral of the diagonal part, these two multiply together, which is just negative one over beta cosine of beta t dt. Do you see how, it's imp how important it is that I put one dt down here? Because when you multiply these together, you got to get a dt, right? You got to have a dt in your integral. So it comes from doing these two together. Um, I'm going to pull. So, I'm going so to pull, we just drop all that stuff at the front before, right? Or do we do we put it in now? What stuff up here? That yes. Oh yeah, I'll come back to this. Oh okay, gotcha. Yeah, I've got to come back to this. I'm, I'm everything I'm doing right now. I'm working within the black brackets. The black brackets are going to turn into whatever this answer is. Then we got to go stick it back up here. So I'm going to pull the constant out. It's going to become plus one over beta. And then I'll do the integral of cosine of beta t dt. And now I'm ready for the antiderivative of cosine of beta t, which I can handle. I can handle that because there's no more, um, no more t's in front of it. So that antiderivative should just be 1 over beta sine beta t. And then I'll have plus a constant in here. I can do it now if I want. See, do y'all understand what I was saying in the beginning of class? Like, this is a major shifting of gears. Like, this is like, there's a lot going yeah, on here. Yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you because I think I, I think I have like an understanding right now. Mm -hmm. So when we're choosing the U and the the DV, correct? Yep. Uh, the U usually is something we want to chip away at. Is that is that how is that how to think how I should think about it or? You should think that, yes, but it's not always the case. It's not always the case? Okay. Yeah. Okay. If it was, I, trust me, if I, could, if I could tell you that, I would. Like, if I could give you that, I would. I can't, though, because I'm going to show you an example, hopefully, today, so, if I have time. Yeah, so that's, don't that's, do that. that's, what, that's what I was thinking. So if there's a way to chip away at something by taking the antiderivative of it, it would be the DV. Is that is that? 
I think True what's going to dictate it is what's the other function you're dealing with okay. here because we had the cosine we could see that that's going to cycle back and forth mm -hmm. and that would allow us to chip away at the t yeah but if it wasn't a sine or cosine that didn't do some sort of cycling like that maybe that gets more complicated yeah or you know so then it has an impact on okay. things so okay. we're just going to have to see but you definitely want to be thinking hey if i can chip it away and and kind of uh, kill that power off with multiple iterations of integration by parts, and that's why I'm going to go if I can do it. Okay, all I did here is put the one over beta times one over beta in front is one over beta squared, and now I'm ready to go back and take this expression up here. Right here's where we were equals one over beta t squared sine of beta t. Right, that's where we were minus, we pulled a two over beta out, and now comes what was in this bracket. And everything in this bracket is now this. I'm going to not have enough room. I'm, I'm going to put it right here. So just remember, this all turns into this. Um, this is all work that we did over here. Y'all with me? I'm going yes, to distribute the negative two over beta through to those two. So I get one over beta t squared sine of beta t plus two over beta squared t cosine of beta t minus two over beta cubed sine of beta t, the whole thing plus a constant. I'll just put the constant on the very outside. It doesn't matter if I do this times this, it's still a constant, so I just put plus c. You got all that? Yes, sir. Not yet. I'm not going to get rid of it, but there it is. Whoa, right? Wow. That's a lot of work to figure out that the antiderivative, what was the thing we were doing? We were doing the antiderivative of t cubed. Oh, no, wait, it was t squared, sorry. We said t cubed so many times. t squared cosine beta t, dt. Which means, everyone, which means that if I take the derivative of this stuff in this box, right? If I take the derivative of that, I should get t squared cosine beta t, right? That's what it means. Do we dare? Why not? Do we dare? Uh, I'll do it for one because we don't have time for this, but just to make us feel good that we got it, right? I'm gonna take the derivative of that and prove to you it's t squared cosine beta t. So I've got three things to take derivative of. I have a product rule right there. I have a product rule right there. Luckily for me, the last one doesn't have a product rule. Remember that beta is a constant. Here we go, product rule. Derivative of the first part is two over beta t, because the two just comes out. t goes to the first power. Multiply that times sine of beta t. Okay, plus product rule here. Derivative of sine of beta t is beta cosine beta t, chain rule times the first function, which was one over beta t squared. Okay, that's just the product rule in the first one. Plus, now the product rule here. So this is just two over beta squared t. Two over beta squared is a constant. Constant times t, take the derivative, you just get the constant, two over beta squared, times the cosine of beta t, plus product rule. Now, derivative of cosine of beta t is negative beta sine beta t, all right? That's a derivative of that one times this one, which is two over beta squared t, running out of room. Then I do minus, and now, so I finished the product rule on this one. Now just derivative of this one, derivative of sine of beta t is gonna be beta cosine beta t, but then times this, so negative two, over beta cubed constant 
times the beta and then the cosine of beta t. All right. I think, I think this and this are the same thing, aren't they just off by a sign? Two over beta squared cosine beta t. These betas cancel, I get negative two over beta squared cosine beta t. So those are gone. What else cancels? I think this one and this one cancel, these two. Because this is two over beta t sine beta t, this beta cancels one of those and I get a two over beta t sine beta t, but it's negative. See the negative? So this cancels with that. And all I'm left with is this and the betas cancel and I'm left with t squared cosine beta t. It worked. So I guess what Luis said earlier, it's easier to fall than to climb back up. And that's mm -hmm. really, it's true. Absolutely, freaking lootly, right? Oh I mean, my God. <laughs> it's so difficult to just take something as simple as t squared cosine beta t and go find its antiderivative. It's a very hard thing to do. I mean, look at how complicated this antiderivative is. So right? my question is, like, not as like you have the answer, but what do you think the answer is? Why it is so difficult for you to go up, you multiply, you divide. You, you know, you got E, Lin cancels, log, Lin, they cancel. Like, why is it so hard? Like, cons like as like a total principle on why we can't go up so easily? Yeah, it's the just the nature of it is that if you need to end with the T squared times a cosine beta T, right? If that's what you need to end with, then you've got to start somewhere with like a T cubed somewhere. Right, you got to have a t cube somewhere in the original. Do you agree? Like somewhere, or if not, you need that when you do a product, you somehow get a t cubed when you do the product rule. It's just, it's just, it's so complicated. It's too much stuff to keep track of because the product rule, quotient rule, chain rule is so complex. It's not simple to just reverse. In, you can't just mentally reverse engineer the antiderivative. I, all I can say is I, it's just the nature of the, the rules of, of differentiation that make anti-differentiation so hard. That's so funny. We, we just need a genius to come up with a formula. This is getting ridiculous. Well, <laughs> <laughs> the, thing, the thing is, I mean, there is, there is not one. That's the thing. And it's not that there isn't one. There's just, there's proofs to show, it has been proven that there is not a general formula. Okay, so there's a proof that shows it can't exist. So it, that's different than saying we haven't found it. To say we haven't found a formula is one thing. To say we can prove there can't be one is something else. So we know there's not a general formula. Now, here's the thing. Chapter eight in this class, chapter eight is called series. And the whole thing about series is that, is that this is very complicated, right? So do we have another way of doing this where we can get answers that are approximate answers, but the answers are approximate as close as we ever would need them to be, like close enough, right? So like I've said this before, like in the real world, if you're building a plane, there's a certain precision you have within your, you know, what you can make, right? If you're, if you're making a ball bearing or you're making some sort of, machining some part, there's only a certain tolerance you can go to, the precision of the machine itself. So chapter eight says, look, we have an easier way of doing this with series, and it'll be a, as good approximation as you ever want. In fact, if I were doing this, if I wanted to know the antiderivative of this, uh, no, I'm gonna, uh, we, we need time. We need to do more problems. Sorry. I'll show you that later. I could turn this into a series right now and then show you how to find the antiderivative, but I'm not going to, we're going to move on. That's office hours. <laughs> yeah, that's office hours. Okay, so here's your next example. And this one is an example of a not so obvious integration by parts. So this one, you know, what I've been telling you up to this point is go find your U and your DV, right? 
Go figure out what's going to be U, what's going to be DV, do your table. And then I give you this. And you look at it and you're like, well, wait a minute, hold on. There's really only like one thing there, right? Arc sine of pi x. That's kind of like the only thing you have. There's not like a, a distinct u and dv here. Yes? You understand? Gut reaction. I just want to use substitution on that. And what would you use for your substitution though? Pi x. You could do that. And then you would eventually get it to integral of arc sine of u in some, you would have some scalars and some, maybe some constants out here. But if you get to that, you can't, you can't do that. You can tell me what the derivative of that is, but you don't know what the antiderivative of that is. Ah, uh, yeah, that right? would be the problem. That would be the problem. Yeah. So yeah, a basic substitution could get you to something cleaner, but it doesn't solve the ultimate problem, which is what is the antiderivative of inverse sine? We can't use the triangle for that. Mm -mm. Oh, okay. no. I mean, because you're trying to find the antiderivative of a function that you, um, yeah, we don't know the antiderivative of it. The triangle, we did the triangle when we were trying to find the derivative of our sign. When we were trying to find the derivative of our sign, we did a reference triangle. Okay, so look, this is an integration by parts. You ready? But it's not so obvious. So here we go. I'm going to show you what it is. I only have one choice for you, arc sine of pi x. That's my only option for you, which means dv has to be what? The only other thing there. One dx. One dx, okay? Now, that may not seem like it's gonna get you anywhere because thinking about this table, when I go up here, right? When I go up on this table, I'm taking the antiderivative of one. What's it going to create? The antiderivative of one. Should just become x, right? An x, right? And so now it's become more complicated, hasn't it? Yeah. So but... you're sitting there going, you're, you're like, oh man, this is going to suck because it's more complicated. But, but, right? But I, I think I see what's going on here, and this is one of those ones that if if you weren't showing me i'd say it was cheating <laughs> yeah it is this is this is a, a very very nice problem so look we take the derivative the derivative of arc sine of pi x the derivative so you have to go back we talked about this you're about to have a test on this on monday the derivative of that will be one over the square root of one minus whatever's in here pi x squared times pi, because of chain rule, you have to take derivative of what's inside, dx. Now, how comfortable are you with that? Using the formula from first day of class, yeah? A little bit of chain rule, so be careful. See, can you appreciate the pace of this class now? Your, the te your first test is going to test you on whether or not you know how to take that derivative, right? But within the same test, it's just a small, tiny piece of a bigger problem now, right? It's just a little piece of a big problem. So it's just how rapidly things grow here in this class. Okay, so that's this. And then here I go up from here to here, I go to X. And at this point, you should be really like discouraged because you're like, shit, that looks terrible. That looks absolutely horrible. But you have no other choice. This is the only option you have. You cannot do this. You cannot make a table that looks like this. Dx here, inverse sine of pi x here. You can't do that for several reasons. If you go down, now you're doing the derivative of the derivative. Now you're like in a second derivative, but more importantly, how are you gonna integrate sine inverse of pi x? That's the freaking problem. That's the original problem, isn't it? That's what, we're, that's what I'm asking you to do. So how are you gonna do that? It's not gonna happen. You know, see what I mean? So that's not a choice. Okay, so let's just keep writing. I mean, we have no choice but to write. So let's, let's go, let's go. So we're gonna multiply these two together. That's X inverse sine of pi X minus integral. And now the diagonal, these two multiplied. So X 
times one over square root of one minus, I'm gonna go ahead and do pi squared x squared. I'm gonna go ahead and square both of these and then times pi dx. Any questions? Can I pull a constant out? Pi? You want to pull pi? Yeah, you probably could, yeah. Y yes. Just pull pi out of the whole integral. And now we have this x over, let me put the x just on top, square root of one minus pi squared x squared dx. Shoot, man. Okay, so now I'm gonna do a poll. And I just wanna know, where's my poll? Um, I just wanna know yes or no, take a minute to look at it, but yes or no, do you know what to do now? Yes or no? Can you handle that, that new integral? Can you handle it? I'll give you all a minute to look at it. So about half of you, a little more than half of you, five out of nine that have responded are not sure, seven out of nine are not sure. So I'm gonna let you keep looking. I think calculus two really forces you to figure out what type of problem solver you are. Are you the type of person who, when you get a problem, you can't figure it out, you quit? And you're just like, I, you know, your brain just says, forget this. I can't, you know, I can't do this. I'm not, you know, are you the type of person who won't be able to go to sleep until you figure it out, right? And I think that's really what the whole idea of higher education is when it, when it comes to STEM is to create people who just, you know, live for problem solving, for critical thinking. It's a, it's a puzzle. This is a big puzzle we're trying to figure out, right? That's what we're trying to do here. All right, so I've got five yeses and I've got eight noes. And I'm not quite sure how to, I mean, if I can even teach this. So I'm just going to ask somebody who, who uh, knows what to do to, to share it with us. Was that a general or a yeah, specific? Yes, just anybody, yeah. You uh, take that one minus pi squared x squared and you set that to be your u. So you're gonna do a u substitution from last class. Yes, because- so let u be, I'm gonna let you finish. Let u be the one minus pi squared x squared, because why? Uh, because when you take that derivative, you get the one cancels and then pi squared times two x pi squared and two are uh, constants that you can then uh, multiply out. Perfect. So you have to see the u substitution here. That if you, t the, the denominator, the pi squared is supposed to, is throwing you off, right? That's it's just a number, all right? So you've got one minus a number in front of x squared. The derivative of that is gonna be, well, the one's gone. The negative pi squared just comes for the ride. Two comes out, joins the pi squared or negative pi squared, and then you have x. So this becomes du equals negative two pi squared x dx. And Hunter, I'm, I'm guessing you made that substitution because you recognize that the numerator has the x dx. That is the derivative of this thing that you let u be, right? Yes. That was your something, right? The yellow was the something, and the blue was the derivative of that something off by a constant, a really weird constant, but still a constant, right? 
Y'all with me now? Y'all okay with that? So when I told you last class, like you can't do integration by parts until you've really kind of mastered substitution, this is an illustration of that. You've got to really understand how substitution works. Look, I'm the messenger, okay? I'm the messenger. But you, you can get this. This takes, this takes work. This takes a lot of work, all right? Okay, so all I'm doing now is I'm scaling out. I'm dividing by the negative two pi squared. I'm scaling it out so I can get my x dx over here. And then I'm gonna replace this piece here with u. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take everything here in, um, sorry, I hear some background stuff. I'm gonna take everything here in this bracket and I'm just gonna just treat this over here as its own problem. I'm gonna do integral x over square root of one minus pi squared x squared dx. And I'm gonna rewrite it in terms of u. So in terms of u now, like we said, the x dx gets replaced with something and then this gets replaced with something. So it should be one over square root of u. That's just the yellow part. And then the x dx gets replaced with one over negative two pi squared du. That's this right here. I'll pull the negative one over two pi squared out. I'll rewrite this as u to the negative one half du. And then I'm gonna use the power rule, right? Which is the, one of the first rules we learned. So this should be negative one over two pi squared times, and now I have to add one to that, which gives me negative one half plus one is one half. So I'm gonna have like one over a half, u to the half. But that just turns- It could just be two. Two, so that's gonna be one over two pi squared times two. Uh, that's the same as square root of u, right? but u was the one minus pi squared x squared. So I'm substituting back in what the u was. I'm gonna cancel the twos. Final result here, negative one over pi squared, square root of one minus pi squared x squared, plus a constant, that's fine. We can throw it in here now. Yes. Okay, back up here. Equals x sine inverse of pi x minus pi times that integral which we just did and got this answer. And I'll put the plus C on the outside. And maybe the last thing to do is distribute the negative pi through. Plus, when I distribute the negative pi through, one of the pi's cancels, because I have a pi squared on the bottom. Square root of one minus pi squared x squared plus c. Welcome uh, to Calhoun. That's a really nice one. Yeah. So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to go to, let me see here. I don't know where I want to go yet. Let's, let's do Wolfram Alpha first. I'm going to put integrate um, arc sine of pi x, right? Was that what it was? Mark sign. Was it pi x? Right. Yes. Okay, let's do that. See what it gives us. You can see that. Is that what we got? 
Do we have x arc sine of pi x times one over pi times the square root of one minus pi squared x squared? That's what we got, right? Integral, let's see. I don't know how this works. Arc sine of pi times x. Okay, same answer, right? So they did a little different. They did a U substitution to start, and then they did integration by parts after, then they simplified, okay? So I just want you all to be aware of this, okay? I want this to be a warning to all of you that I'm very aware of what's out there. I'm very aware with you taking a test at home, I'm very aware it's very difficult for me to keep an eye on you, but I can very easily tell the difference between a symbol labs work and a human beings work, all right? Because human beings don't work like computers work especially in Cal 2, all right? They will do things that are not natural. They'll do things that are just the way the computer, the algorithm is set up. So I wanna see what you can do, right? It's, it's not about, look, we can go type in the answer. We, we can go get the answer like that, okay? What, what differentiates a good engineer from a bad engineer or someone who could actually get an engineering degree from someone who can't is the people who go to look for their answer here as opposed to actually understanding how to do it by hand. Do y'all see there's like a huge gap of, of difference between a person who needs to go here to get an answer and a person who actually can mechanically get the answer on their own? There's like two different people you're, you're talking about, right? Two completely different people. So, you know, show me what you can do. Show me what you can do and work hard at it. What do y'all think about moving the test? What, do you think... Would y'all y'all want to keep this where it is, or do you want maybe another, like do it a week from today and give you a little more time? How do y'all feel? We're gonna keep it where it's at right now. Keep it. I don't know. I I appreciate more time just because of work and such. Poll. Let's just do a poll. It doesn't. Do you want to? Okay. So yes, yes means keep it the way it is. Yes means keep it the way it is. And no means let's have some more time. Well, I just need to get those office hours and I can't this week. That's the problem. Okay. There's still going to be more stuff that we need to learn. So if we take a test on top of the stuff that we're learning, we won't have time to like learn it. That's yeah. just my opinion. Yeah. Look, I'm it, with it, it, on only, that it only gets harder. Okay. It only <laughs> gets harder. So yeah. we want, we, we definitely have to, um, Let's do this. Let's keep it the way it is. It's about 50-50. Let's keep it where it is, but here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna keep the integration by parts problems simple, okay? Meaning, meaning it'll be the U, there will be a U and a DV. Um, it won't be repeated, okay? So just the basic idea of integration by parts you need to know, the basic idea, all right? The next test, I'll throw some stuff in there well, it'll probably be built into other problems because later on we do problems where it turns into an integration by parts problem. So it'll be, you know, embedded within something else. So for this first test, I'll, uh, when I look at, uh, when we're done here, I'll look at the problems on the, in the book and I'll tell you, yeah, these problems here are about what you should expect. All right. Let's see if we can't squeeze one more in here. Yeah, we got this one. So this one was not so obvious. We picked the only thing we could pick, and amazingly, we were able to get this to work out. The next one, I call the rabbit out of the hat problem, because, you know, when you think about a magician, right? A magician just pulls a rabbit out of the hat. Oh, my God, where did the rabbit come from? This is kind of like that. It's like, it's like, what? You know, like, okay, I didn't see that coming. You know, one thing I will say about this is this is eating notebook paper. <laughs> yes, yes. All right, so let's think about this first. No basic U substitution is going to work here. Okay, we can't just say, oh, U is this, and then there's its derivative, and everything gets nicer. 
Um, we do have kind of two distinct things here. We have e raised to the 2x being multiplied by cosine x. So when we were talking earlier, right? Remember Mohammed had brought up like, what if it was t cubed? Then we'd chip away at that t, right? And I said, well, you know, the cosine being there was important because the cosine would keep switching as we did the chipping, right? Well, here you have e to the 2t. And the problem with e to the 2t is you can't chip away at it, right? You keep taking derivative of e to the 2t and you're still gonna keep on getting e to the 2t, understand? No chipping away on e to the 2t. And at the same time, you can't chip away at cosine because every time you try and differentiate cosine, you're gonna get sine or, you know, or integrate. It's, it appears from this that both of these things are cyclical. Does, does that make sense? Like as you differentiate and integrate, you're gonna keep getting some version of sine cosine e and nothing's ever gonna vanish. Would you agree just by kind of thinking about it? Would, would we chain roll that 2x a little bit though? That would just be yeah, pulling so two out. Some constants. We get some constants popping out, but those will come out of the integral, right? So it really wouldn't help us. So it appears at first glance that there's just like maybe no hope with this. All right. All right. So we got to go. We got to try something because integration by parts is pretty much all we got. So I'm just going to make a choice here. I'm gonna go ahead and just let the u be e to the 2x, okay? And then I'm gonna let my dv be the other part, cosine x dx. All right, that was a choice I made. I'm committed to it now, and I'm gonna see what happens. So I take the derivative of this, and this is where we get that chain rule. The two would pop out when we do the derivative of that. Everyone clear on that? Derivative e to the 2x is itself times derivative of what's up, up top, which is two, it pops out. Okay, the antiderivative of cosine is sine. And so this becomes, these two multiply together, e to the two x sine x minus the integral of the diagonal, right? And the diagonal is gonna give us sine x times 2e to the 2x dx. Just gonna clean up e to the 2x. And when I say clean up, I'm just gonna pull the two out because it's annoying. Minus two integral. Um, all I have left here is the sine x and the e to the 2x. I'm gonna write it back in this order where the e was first. It doesn't matter, but I'm just gonna write it that way. Okay, questions on that? Did we gain anything? No, sir. Not really, right? I mean, all we've done is just rewritten the same problem, right? We have the same exact integral, but the sine instead of cosine. So it doesn't seem we, like we anything is going to work. What's that? Well, we, we could try again using um, doing, uh, instead of setting u equal to um, e to the power 2x, we could try something else. So are you saying start the problem over and yeah. do a different U or continue and use a different U? Well, like it's do integration it's, by parts on this piece or, or start over? Yeah, I was saying start over. Okay, you kind so of yeah, maybe we could start over. Maybe we could. Let's, let's back burner that. We might need to start over, right? Let's back burner that. Let me continue, all right? Because I got to pull the rabbit out of the hat, okay? So here it comes. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do it again. And it's gonna seem like I shouldn't do this. I'm gonna go e to the two x and then here dv, I'm gonna get uh, the other part, which is sine x dx, okay? Seems like I shouldn't do that because I already kind of know what my new integral is gonna be. And when I do this du, I get my two e to the two x again dx. And then V is the antiderivative of sine, which is negative cosine. And I should be saying here that everything in this bracket is what I'm working on over here, right? Let's do it this way. Keep this separate. So this over here, I'm working on this one right here. 
this now becomes that whole integral without the negative two becomes these two multiply together. So negative two, oh no, not two, negative e to the two x cosine x. Do y'all see that? That's just these two multiply. And then minus integral of negative cosine x times two e to the two x dx. Clean it up, negative e to the two x cosine x plus two integral e to the two x cosine x dx. Okay, so I pulled the negative out, I pulled the two out, I rearranged the order of these and put it back at this. Y'all got it? Understand where we are? Any questions on where we are? We look at that integral and we say, shit, <laughs> right? That's the original problem, right? That's the original problem. All right, well, you know what? It's actually a good thing because watch what I'm gonna do now. Let's, let's see where we were. This right here, the left side, or this left part of this was, was e to the two x sine x minus two, right? Minus two, and then everything in the black was this. So I need to take that two and distribute it through to this. So I'm gonna distribute that through. And let me, let me box this off so you realize that's separate up there. Y'all understand that? Just, just bring in it, just bring in this piece in and I'm going to distribute the negative two through plus two e to the two x cosine x. That's me distributing here to here. And then when I go from here to here, I get minus four because that negative two hits that two. And then I still have the integral of e to the two x cosine x dx. Now again, that should, we, we should feel stuck at this point that we basically have the original problem sitting over here, right? Right, but check this out. This, what we're saying is that this integral here, right, equals that, which equals this, right, which equals this down here. So the original integral that we're trying to find right, the original integral is equal to this, right, is equal to this. And here's the original integral over here on this side also, right? Add it, add four of them to both sides, right? If I add four of these integrals to this side, Well, that's like adding apples and apples, right? So over on the right side, it goes away, right? And on this side, I have one of those integrals and I added four of them. So I should have five of them, right? Five of those integrals. So five of these integrals should be equal to e to the two x sine x plus two e to the two x cosine x. One more step. What do you think? Divide by five. five. What's that? Divide by five. Yeah, divide everything by five. Divide by five on this side. Divide by five here. Divide by five here. Now, the one thing you do have to remember is that this is the antiderivative. So you have to remember that there is a plus c. We do have a plus C. We know we're always gonna have a plus C. So our final result here, our final result is that the integral of e to the two x cosine x dx 
is equal to one fifth e to the two x sine x plus two fifths e to the two x cosine x plus some constant. Yeah, I like this one. Yeah, the rabbit out of the hat was seeing that the original integral appeared on the other side. Now, Joshua, I, I, uh, you, Joshua had said earlier, maybe we, we should have tried it by doing, or was it? Um, Joshua was saying, well, maybe we just start this over and do it the other way. Put cosine here and e to the 2x here. If you do that, the same thing will happen. You have to go twice through integration by parts, and then the original integral will appear on this side again. But you, you know, you you have to you have to go through it. It's going to look different than this because the the choice of u and dB is different. So, in retrospect, again, going back and looking at this, now that I know this, what happened? This e to the two x and the cosine x; those are both cycling as I do derivatives and in integrals. So if I do this enough times, I should get the original integral to appear somewhere in my integration by parts. And then I can just add it to both sides. Okay, Hunter, were you gonna say something? Oh, I was just gonna say that I can see why it's called a rabbit out of the hat. <laughs> yeah, e to the two x, let's try a symbol out. Uh, what was it, cosine? Times cosine. X. Yeah, I'm cosine. Curious, I'm curious to see how, how they tell you to do it. Steps, apply integration by parts, take the constant out, apply integration by parts again, take the constant out. Then you've got this and see this step right here, they say isolate e to the two x cosine x dx. That's where you see that there's like, it's on this side and that side and you bring it to the other side. That's not obvious. That's not obvious how to get from here to here. But there's the answer. We just got to pay them for that. Answer. You know, you got to pay for that. Yeah, you got to pay for that. I've actually had students turn in work to me before that is basically like just copied out of this. So, and then they denied it, <laughs> which was funny. Hey, sir. Okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, do we still have more? Could I just ask you a question? You can ask questions over the test. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this with our is tests, all we're going to do today, this is all we're doing today. I, I don't have time for another problem. So okay. about the test. Um, about our test, you're looking for our work, right? Yeah. So uh, if we display our work and let's say, or like to the end or to the middle, we mess up, will we still get partial credit for that answer? Absolutely. Or will absolutely. All right. Yeah. I'm I'm more concerned about the process than I am about the answer being correct at the end. Okay. Um. So like on a problem like this, if you did, if you did uh, like some, I don't know, substitution and somehow got an answer, you know what the biggest mistake I see is? The biggest mistake I see is students will take a problem like this, they'll do integration by parts, and then when they get to this step right here, they completely forget everything about calculus and they just give me the antiderivative of each of these separately. They just take the antiderivative of that, and then they take the antiderivative of that, and then they, they just say, that's the answer. Like, that's the biggest mistake I see. Like, uh, that one's not so clear, but maybe like on this one, they'll do integration by parts once. And then once they get to this step right here, they'll just give me the antiderivative of each of those separately. That's the biggest mistake I ever see. I'm not ever see, but that's the, that's the most frequent mistake I see. So I'm looking like when you are looking at the integral, are you using the right method? Like, are you using integration by parts when you're supposed to, right? Are you doing u substitution when you're supposed to? And then if in that work, I can follow it and I can make sense out of it and I see your error, then I can take off points accordingly. But you're always gonna get partial credit, absolutely. There's only one straight path you can literally go. Like if you mess up any piece on the top, you can't go more further like like yeah. down so i guess there's only one right answer into like doing something right well there is always going to be just one antiderivative all right 
plus a constant, right? But how you get to it actually can vary. So like the path there can be different. It's not a unique way to get it. Um, especially when we get all, all five methods, in, right? So right now we've, the, the, we've done U substitution, we've done integration by parts, right? So we still need trig integrals, trig sub, partial fraction decomposition. So once we have all of them, then somebody might attack a certain problem with a different method and gets to the same result. Um, and, and, you know, that's what I think makes the next exam so hard is that when I give you an, an, an integral, you don't know what it is. Like it could be integration by parts. It could be partial fraction decomposition. It could be this, it could be that. So it's that problem recognition of looking at it. Ah, I know what to do here. That's, that's what makes it hard, uh, I think, on top of this being hard, but that's what really makes it challenging. So the only way to get good at that is, is repetition, repetition, repetition. On the subject of repetition, do we have any homework for this yeah, section? So, so I would say for, for now, Oh, man. Yeah, so like number, let me see how I only have two minutes. Just want to show this to you. So for this, you might be thinking integration by parts, I'm gonna chip away at the X squared, right? First time through, it'll turn into an X. Second time through, it'll turn into a one, right? You might be thinking that. That's not what, that's not what you need to do. You actually need to let the U be the natural log of X and then let the DV be the X squared. Reason why? What's the derivative of a natural log? One over X. One over X. And then when you do the antiderivative here, you get one third x cubed. And when you put those two together, one of the x's cancels. And then it's just a power rule. Super, super clean. You see, so that's why I couldn't say earlier, just always think to chip away at the x because this is an example where you wouldn't want to. So I would say for your homework, like number one, number two, number three, Number five. I mean, really, one, three, and one, two, three, and five are the only ones that don't require integration by parts more than once or something weird. But I mean, theoretically, you can, you can, you have what you need. Okay. You have what you need to do the problems in that section. It's just a matter of, me showing you some more examples to kind of help you get, get the plane off the ground. Um, but those four, I'd say those four, I'll keep the problems on the test for integration by parts. Um, like I said, basic. This, this gets a basic idea down. Now that might change a little bit of the way I set the test up though, because I don't want to give you four basic integration by parts problems. So you might have a little bit more of some of this other stuff. <clears throat> All right. Yeah. So, what have we not done? Can, can you go back real quick? Let me take a picture of that real quick. A second. Yeah. Hey, y'all remember also that I'm uh, I'm uploading these notes, right? Did y'all get that email that I sent out? I'm uploading everything I write here. I'm uploading it to a, a folder where you can go download the PDF of that later. In fact, I'll do it right now. Doesn't take me long. Um, it's there. All right. Well, we're out of time. We're done. How are y'all feeling? One last question. Yeah. Uh, it's just in terms of like what we're turning in for the homework. It says uh, 
uh, six point one first part one through seven. Yeah. So, uh, like you said, you the one, two, three, and five the simpler problems, but also that's along with the other four, six, and seven that we're doing this week for. Yeah, uh, you know what I would say is this for this homework that I want you to turn in, right? The handwritten homework that that you're going to turn in by Monday. Just do do as much as you can in six point one. OK, if you don't get through it all, that's OK. But just make sure that you feel comfortable with the basic idea of integration by parts so that you're ready for the test. All right. That and then we're going to have to continue 6.1. There's some more examples I need to give you some problems that are a little, little weird. Um, you have the basic concepts. So, so we'll, we'll be coming back to this. This isn't yes. going to be next time we're going to something else. No, but it will be. <laughs> It'll be relatively fast. I'm gonna do this example. I'm gonna do this example and I'm gonna do that example. And then that's it, three examples and then we're moving on. And that'll be next Thursday that we move that we move on. So I had a question. So it's regarding the tests and on the test day, uh, myself and Miyaki, uh, where we have a class that's on campus. Mm -hmm. um, you want us to go like to some, somewhere quiet, right? And take the exam there. Yeah, I think there's a lot of little like cubby hole places that you can find. I think the library, the computer lab. Um, I'm at the library right now. Yeah. The Wi Fi might suck though. So, really? Have you seen that, that? I've heard different things on that. So, I was having a rough time getting into class in time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The we're we're going to be at SAC instead of uh, Northwest Vista. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. Let's just play it, play it by ear, see how it happens, you know? Because if you if you run into an issue where you have a you know connectivity issue and you can't be here, I'm 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 gonna work with you. But that means you if you can't be at the test, that means you have to do a makeup test. To do a makeup test, it's not the original test, it's a different test. And those are always different, right? So but uh, see how it goes. And then you have my cell phone number. So if you're there and you just can't get through, just at least let me know what's going on. That way I'm aware. Got it. Too. Appreciate it. Yeah, that's a real tricky thing, right? Because when I was trying to make my teaching schedule this semester, you know, I was trying to teach on um, face to face, but then I had Zooms in there. So if you have those on the same day, you know, it's, it's a problem because, yeah. I'm zooming from home, but I'm I can't zoom from my office. So I understand what you're going through there. Okay. Yeah, I'll give you a call if something happens. Um okay. uh, yep. a window router or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh I was thinking of bringing my tripod and just like having like, I don't know, like the um, the camera will be facing Miyaki and I, like we'll be like in opposite directions or something, but yeah. do something. Whatever it takes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, so thank you. Appreciate right. it. Yep. Y'all are free to go unless you have a question. Thank you, Professor. All right. Study hard. Thank you, sir.